Kel and I were talking the other day about how come we don't make soda bread all year? We love soda bread. Why do, why do we only make it at St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> I cooked a corned beef a couple weeks ago. Oh, uh, see, St. Patrick's is like the only time of year that it like comes down in price enough that we're willing to pay it. Oh, I feel like if you check out your local grocery outlet, they carry it year round. Well, a lot of the places right here have it year round, but yeah, most but they of them carry they it year round have a at shitty a, price at a grocery outlet price. Grocery outlets think, here don't have great prices. I get better prices at Winco than I do at Grocery Outlet for most things. I don't know. I think I paid like nine bucks for the last one. How big was it? What are you paying a pound? Just gotta like look four, at four, four ish a pound. See, that's too much. I mean. It's like nine per pound in the other grocery stores. It gets, it's got to get down to like two or three for. You're you're supposed to be Irish. Them or down. I'm Scottish. I'm mostly Scottish. Which is supposed to be even. I guess that's even cheaper. So. <laughs> I remember my campaign posters from high school. <laughs> so that Scottish, you far as plaid? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure which part we got in trouble. This was on the advice of our mother. I was running for class treasurer, and our mother suggested I put up a sign that said, Throughout history, two races have been known for their frugality, the Jews and the Scottish. I don't remember that one. Oh, yes. I don't remember that part of it. Yes. Oh. My opponent is not Jewish, but Nick McDonald is so Scottish he farts (laughs) plaid. I, uh... I got to talk to the principal about that one. Principal wouldn't even tell me what part he had a problem with, and that was the most upsetting part. Was I didn't know if he had a problem with the fart part or the Jewish part. I did, I have no idea. <laughs> You'll never know. <laughs> no. Everybody, it's the Booze and Spirits podcast. <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm Kate McDonald. <laughs> She's like a drink with death. I'm Nick McDonald. <laughs> Did you just say I'm like a drink with death? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Skip the tagline and jump straight to the introduction. Well, we usually do the introduction and then the tagline. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do, though. That's because you keep fucking it up. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> It's all right. I've just decided I'm going to just keep opening the show like Krusty the cr- the Clown from now on, <laughs> or Krusty the Crown, you know, the the Netflix series. <laughs> <laughs> Today we are talking about St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> which uh, I realize this episode's not coming out quite at St. Patrick's Day, but like I've said many, many times, our layout of episodes versus holidays is completely biting us in the ass. I mean, we could probably adjust at some point in time, but eh. Yeah. Eh. Yeah. Eh. I figure at one point, because people love us so, so much, we're going to go weekly instead of bi-weekly, and then it will all work out. Someone's going to have to watch my kid, or he'll just be on the podcast. Uh, he'll be 22 by the time that happens, so it's not a problem. Oh, okay, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> he'll have his own life. He'll be plenty busy. <laughs> We'll still be doing podcasts while everyone else is doing holographic. Yeah, holographic it. phone, holographic. Theo's breathing in the microphone again. Google Glass or something. Got going for us. Lay down, dirt. <laughs> he did not lay down. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite. He stood up higher, is what he did when you said that. Oh wait, my posture's on. <laughs> this is my life. So amateur night. I mean St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> the name of the game. Kate has contested that St. Patrick's Day is amateur night for true drinkers. <laughs> Serious drinkers and alcoholics. I mean, we drink like that the rest of the year. So That's right. <laughs> I mean, it's not saying we don't do it on St. Patrick's Day. It's just not like the only time that that happens. It's just harder, harder to get a drink then. <laughs> From the bartender. We just have to wear green and hopefully get to eat corned beef in the process. <laughs> lay down, Derp. See you. Lay down. He's derping so hard. <laughs> I derp so hard. Hashtag I derp so hard. Come here. Come breathe in the microphone again. So, St. Patrick's Day. I mean, I'm not sure that it's really logical for our family to celebrate St. Patrick's Day anyway, because like... Well, here, and it, that's the dirty truth of St. Patrick's Day is... When you're a kid, you're taught, oh, St. Patrick drove all the snakes out of Ireland. But when they say snakes, that's really like Christian. Code for pagans. Yeah, exactly. Which so they can... are our people, so... Fuck off. <laughs> 
Fuck it, let's drink. That's right. Well, but this is kind of like, you know, my favorite thing about Mardi Gras is Mardi Gras is a Christian holiday that the pagans have kind of taken over. I think St. Patrick's Day is, is, it's not quite as far in that direction, but it's starting to, to head that way. It's If not the pagans have taken over, the heathens definitely are taking it over. The heathens have definitely taken over both of those holidays. Yes. <laughs> I was reading up on it. St. Patrick's Day is actually the national holiday or, or you know, a holiday celebrating a nation or a people that is celebrated most around the world so which is weird like the historical context here just kind of baffles me because <laughs> america is like so like yeah saint patrick's day we didn't treat the irish like second class citizens for millions of years not millions obviously but well they treat them like second class citizens for a hundred years or so and then someone else came along and they could treat like crap and and they kind of got elevated up the totem pole exactly. saint patrick's day is celebrated in you know u.s obviously uh ireland obviously england uh-oh my browser froze i thought you said your brow was froze oh uh, no my browser froze did it freeze into the rock vibe <laughs> the people vibe? <laughs> St. Patrick's Day is celebrated in England, Malta, Russia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Scotland, Switzerland, Lithuania, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Montserrat, Canada, Mexico, the U.S., Argentina, Australia, New Zealand, even on the International Space Station. I really want to see Bosnian St. Patrick's Day. I want to see Russian St. Patrick's Day. What kind of fuck around is that going to be? You'll drink vodka mixed with whiskey and green food color. I want to ride a green bear into the middle of the red square. That would be bitching. Where are you going to get a green bear? You die him. You die a fucking river. You can die a bear. You have to bleach the bear before you can dye him green. This is a lot of work. Okay, tell you what. You go cut your lawn and don't pick up the trimmings and let your dog out there and tell me what color he turns. My dog <laughs> will only turn green on the not dark colored spots. And he'll probably be even more itchy because he's allergic to apparently life. <laughs> Um, it's something uh, interesting I learned was that St. Patrick supposedly, uh, the way that he was able to sell the Irish pagans on Christianity was by using the shamrock to explain the Holy Trinity. Yes. Apparently the Irish couldn't wrap their head around that until we find out the three leaves on there. The trifecta of pants being. Of course, it's the four leaf one that's lucky, so what the fuck's that tell you? <laughs> Which is a mutant, <laughs> which is a whole different tangent I can go off on, which I feel like I wrote a paper about in like elementary school. <laughs> mutant for the clovers and the X-Men. That's right. The only thing more powerful than God is the X-Men, and it's time that we all appreciated that for your St. Patrick's Day celebrations. Yeah. I feel like Gambit would be fun to party with on St. Patrick's Day, too. <laughs> Probably, but he might also rob you and leave you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> What? Not Wolverine, though. Sean says not Wolverine, which is, I mean, he'd be fun to watch Wolverine on St. Patrick's Day, but you wouldn't want to be, like, get drunk. too close. He's but not... he would get pissed off and beat people for no reason. He would. I mean, it would have a reason. But... He would punch some drunks, but, I mean, Sean's got a point. He can't get drunk. But he'd be angry the whole time. <laughs> and have you ever been sober and angry in a large crowd of drunk people? Mm-hmm. Yes, I have. It is, it's awful. <laughs> Thank, thank God you've never been that way with adamantium claws. Or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is why bartenders are all alcoholics, because we have to deal with all these drunk idiots while we're, I mean, in the state of Oregon, completely sober. <laughs> very state to state. Oh, and yeah. whether or not it's when I, was, when I worked at the fine dining restaurant, they wanted to transition me into the bar, and I was not looking forward to that possibility <laughs> for that exact reason. <laughs> I was resistant to the idea, one might say. Drunk people seem to be scared of me when I'm bartending. They act up, so. <laughs> Can't trust the little ones. They'll cut you. That's right. So, we got St. Patrick's Day ghost stories, I guess. I guess we got Irish stories. As... Well, just remember that we don't ever actually discuss really what our theme means we're like hey we're gonna do this and then one of us ultimately fucks it up the vagary is to protect you and your drink making <laughs> because and and god bless you i don't know what you have in mind yet but i'm i'm really eager to see what you came up with for a saint patrick's day drink that isn't already just an irish car bomb like that's <laughs> irish car bomb irish car bombs are my mom said she would never go to a bar with me. <laughs> um 
I have a drink. I haven't actually made it yet because there was vets and teething babies, and I haven't been to the liquor store. No, but no. I have a plan here. I think it's going to be good. All right. Okay. Well, we'll we'll get to also, that. Also, I've met all of your other challenges for these drinks. Like, hey, no, I know. I know you have. Like the guy that said, can we make something red with gold flakes in it and have it not suck? I did that. I know. I I deserve a medal of... You're doing quite well, but I'm also, you know... Did you say a medal of malarkey? Yeah. Sean says I deserve a medal of malarkey. <laughs> you <He's> do. probably <laughs> correct. <laughs> can that be our next sticker? Fuck yes. Can we get... Ooh, maybe I can get gold foil ones that'll <laughs> say ooh, medal of malarkey ooh, on them. That'd ooh. be amazing. I will just take those to bars and put them on people. <laughs> and I would encourage that. <laughs> Is that gold with the lettering in red? Well, wait. Does it have to... I mean, red might be hard to read on gold foil. Or vice versa, if you read with a gold lettering. Well, we were going to do gold, or you would do blue, because blue ribbon are the, the top of the ribbon pile. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> a white ribbon with a black stripe, because what the fuck does that even mean? Probably something. <laughs> Before we actually print these, let's Google it. Make sure we're not doing some like weird white supremacist thing. <laughs> Didn't mean to. That's your worry about everything. <laughs> How did I get signed up for a Q mailing list? <laughs> All right. Do you want to go first or should I? Um, can go first. Pretend I remember what I'm talking about. And I know how to pronounce it. Oh, yeah. This could, there's going to be so many mispronunciations of this. It's atrocious. People of Ireland, we are we, very We apologize sorry. so much. So, I was going to talk about the jester ghost of Malahide Castle. Okay. But I found out Malahide Castle has several ghosts. Should I give a quick rundown? Sure. Let's, or no? I mean, if you got a quick summary, let's. Okay. So, Malahide Castle is in Malahide, Dublin County, Ireland. It was built in 1185 by King Henry II for his friend Sir Richard Talbot. The Talbot family it was the most powerful family, one of the most powerful families in Ireland, to the extent that King Edward IV felt obliged to expand their castle massively. So that's like when it got its towers. It was during the Edward the Fourth era. Huge tracts of land. What do you think a roundhead is? <laughs> One you can't set your beer on. <laughs> well, the page I'm looking at says, I mean, maybe the a roundhead's Protestants. Like that so, might the website be I'm it. reading that this fact from says they were also <laughs> Roman Catholic and were massively against the Roundheads. A member who took or over supporter the... of the Parliamentary Party in the English Civil War. Okay, so it's not just a weird derogatory term for Protestants. I mean, no, it's it's uh, it's not even derogatory. It's that's what they called themselves. The Roundheads were in support of a Parliament and representation rather than just monastic rule from the king. Well, if you're a monarch, that just sucks. Okay. Anyway, so the the Roundheads did take control of the castle in 1649 for, I think, about 50 years. But then the Talbot family had control until 1979 when they sold it to pay their inheritance taxes. It is one of the oldest castles in Ireland and one of the most haunted, having a total of at least five ghosts. The ghosts that we know are there are uh, Miles Corbett, who was an English politician who from the Roundheads. For some reason, my mind Roundheads reads like backyard again. It's like it's just like a group. Of- He's a backyard again. <laughs> but Miles Corbett didn't get along with the local population, who were mostly Catholic. He was anti-Catholic. He tried to outlaw it in Malahide and started attacking the local abbey. Get many of Cromwell's knights to completely destroy the people's place of prayer and earned the reputation of being a dictator. In 1660, he was overthrown and executed. Monarchy was reinstated and King Charles II was put into power. So he was going to be executed. His head was on the platter. Yeah. The moment he f- heard of this, he fled to the Netherlands. However, they caught him two years later, took him back to Malahide, and executed him. He was hanged, drawn, and then quartered as an example. <laughs> I love when they just keep mutilating a body. Just Since then, Corbett's ghost is said to haunt the castle. His ghost can be quite unsettling. It runs throughout the castle on the anniversary of his death. He also appears other times of year. His He's usually in a full suit of armor. And it's said that the ghost has a habit of falling into his like quarters as he was when he was drawn in quarters. So, I feel like that wasn't an even division. Well, it was, I feel it like was that was a lot messier than just... Approximately four parts, okay? Building blocks falling over. We're gonna over. call it quarters just to make things easier here. <laughs> the, there's also the ghost of Walter Hussey, 
hussy. I'm going to go with hussy because I like it better. Who doesn't like a hussy? Uh, wives. Wives don't like hussy. Huh. Didn't know. <laughs> Explains a lot. <laughs> Ask your wife about it. I'm sure she'll tell you how she feels about hussies. <laughs> He was the young Lord Galtrim. He'd been a cavalier. Uh, He'd been sent to Malahide to fight roundheads. During his time there, he fell in love with a woman. Eventually, they decided to marry. It was good news to Hussey's father. He went there to try to persuade the Talbots to let his son be wed in the castle. They agreed. Hussey was still engaged and so made an effort to stay in Malahide. But it did mean that he had to stay whilst the battles and the roundheads moved elsewhere. On the morning of the wedding, Husty was not preparing for battle, but for his wedding instead. Well, that's what you would do on the morning of your wedding. Anyways, he was ambushed by a rival as he traveled to Malahide Castle to be married. The rival was a roundhead with a personal grudge against him. Husty did draw his sword, but it was too late. The roundhead threw his spear at Husty, killing him instantly. After the death of Husty, his wife-to-be actually fell in love with his murderer and soon married him instead. So, <laughs> guess <laughs> You throw a spear like that, you know, you're, you're going to be dropping wet pantaloons all over the countryside. <laughs> I was just going to say, we know who the real hussy is here. <laughs> this tragic and untimely death is remembered by Hussey's ghost. The ghost of Walter Hussey will wander through the castle, sometimes showing his spear wound, believed by many that he's trying to tell people why he did not show up for the <laughs> wedding. Or trying to win a bar bet. Hey, look at this. <laughs> look at this. <laughs> you, do you want to see something gross? <laughs> Then there was uh, the Lord Chief Justice. Well, Lord Chief Justice. They think this was his given name. Was a landowner and the third (laughs) and last husband of Maud Plunkett, which is another ghost I'll talk about. But he's usually seen being chased through the castle by the ghost of his wife. Justice does do some of his own haunting behavior. He was an avid bodybuilder and spent a lot of time fighting with his wife. So he spent any spare time he had exercising. And so you can see him going for a jog or weightlifting. (laughs) So this castle is the Discovery Plus of Haunted really, hearing. Like, this is just... <laughs> I told you. This goes, train wreck TV. Wait till you get to the deciding factor of why this is the haunting I'm talking about. Anyway. All right, yeah. <laughs> the ghost of Maud Plunkett, who was the wife of Chief Justice, lived in the castle <laughs> along the, with the Talbot. When Maud married Chief, it was her third wedding. Chief was uh, unaware of Plunkett's rather petty behavior, which had caused her last two husbands to leave her. As a result, she became very possessive of Chief Justice. Some say that she may have beat her third husband. Even if she didn't, she certainly spent a lot of time arguing with him. Plunkett was apparently very violent during these fights, so that's why Chief Justice would run from her, and she would chase him. That is the reason it's thought the Talbots asked them to leave the castle. (laughs) You gotta do this somewhere (laughs) Uh, Yeah. We're becoming the laughing stock of castles. You guys gotta take this somewhere. (laughs) <laughs> Plunkett's ghost apparently is never seen alone. They believe she is constantly chasing the ghost of Chief Justice, but maybe another paranormal presence. All right, so the reason I picked this story is uh, Puck of Malahide, who was a court jester during the Tudor area. Okay. He was the Talbot family jester, and he, back to the TLC elements here, was a little <laughs> person, approximately yeah. four feet tall. He also was a watchman, and he lived in the tower so he could keep watch from his room. He was well known for being very reclusive and very tidy when he was not working. During his time in the castle, Henry the Eighth became worried of a woman named Lady Eleonora Fitzgerald and sent her away to be held prisoner at Malahide. It was Puck who was made to keep an eye on her. Surprisingly, Puck fell in love with Fitzgerald. He did try to keep it to himself for a while, but he did eventually end up letting the cat out of the bag. Jesters aren't good about keeping secrets to themselves. So because he didn't really come out and say it, it was more rumor mill stuff. The rumor started that Malahide Castle was harboring ties with Fitzgerald, and people started assuming that the Talbots were conspiring with Fitzgerald. They didn't want the rumor to reach the king, so the theory is Puck was found stabbed outside of the castle walls, and it was it's believed he was killed by a member of the Talbot family to stop the rumors before they reached King Henry. A very snowy December morning, Puck was found stabbed just outside the castle walls. Oh, they did start a rumor that Puck killed himself. Like, it is possible, but it's not very believable. Who goes? Who just goes wanders outside the walls to, to kill himself? And to stab right? yourself repeatedly. Like, that's, that's an aggressive suicide there. He did... <laughs> that's like a Hillary Clinton yeah. suicide. Like, he stabbed himself 28 yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> 
I don't know if you should talk about Clinton murders on the podcast. It might not be good for us. Um, <laughs> anyway, before he died, he had said he was going to haunt the castle, but not hurt anyone as long as a male tab- Talbot tablet lived there. <laughs> he does now haunt the castle, but it seems that he's still being non-harmful. He's been seen numerous times, including during the selling of the castle in 1979. He hasn't been seen as much then, but he is often appears in photographs. I tried to find some photographs. I wasn't very successful, but I might keep looking to see if we can find one. Okay. But that's where this really gets into the reason I picked this story. <laughs> Do you want to know who dealt with Puck in this castle? Who who, who Puck is fucking with? Sure. Puck is screwing with Lizzo. <laughs> yeah. How is how and why is Puck screwing with Lizzo? I mean, I don't have a why, but I can tell you the story. Okay. <laughs> so Lizzo took a tour around Malahide Castle in the gardens when she was in Ireland. I think this was 2019. Yeah, in November 2019. The musician told Tracy Clifford that while she was on the tour, she had a spooky supernatural encounter. The star revealed that one of the castle's most famous ghostly residents was up to some trickery when she took the tour. The castle's court jester Puck is said to roam parts of the castle in the afterlife after dying in the 1500s. The minstrel, his name is Puck, he fucked with us, Lizzo said. (laughs) He took my phone and he put it in my dancer's pocket. It was so crazy. We filmed it. It was all on film. So we were there, and they said there's a ghost, and he died of a broken heart, and there's this little door that we all had to knock on for good luck as we left the castle, and it was his door, Lizzo told the radio host. I was so scared, I knocked on it, and then I walked away, and we were about to leave, and I was like, I don't know where my phone is, I couldn't find my phone. They looked all over the castle for it. Then we called it, and it was in my dancer's pocket outside, and she was like, how to get in here? It happened right after I knocked on his door. It's so creepy in there, but so beautiful. That's awesome. So, Puck and I mean, because if, if you're on a tour of a castle, it's not like you set your phone down and forgot about it. I'm sure she was, like, using it and taking pictures I mean, or some such thing. I did find a link to what I think is, like, a either an Instagram story. Let me find. They're in the, yeah, an Instagram story yeah. of that she took inside the castle. Mm-hmm. So, like... That's what I'm saying. So, it's not like she just pocketed her phone and forgot about exactly. it for a couple yeah. hours. Like, she was using it during the... So was it really That's Puck? Right. I don't know, but... Pucking around. Maybe Puck likes a big booty girl. He's all about that juice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Excellent. All right. Uh, I guess I should probably go to my story now, eh? Hey. Hey. Poser. I'll try to not eat pizza in the microphone. Okay. My story will not have the star power that yours had, but it will have a whole lot more mispronunciations. Nice. So I want to talk about the Doer Coup, which is... The what? The Doer Coup. You confident in that? Uh, yeah, I looked up the pronunciation. Maybe the okay. maybe the Dorku. <laughs> I think Dorku. Dorky. Spelled D O B H A R space C H U. Because we're using Gaelic here. We're using some Irish, some traditional ancient Irish here that is incomprehensible. So the Dorku is a water creature that resembles a large otter, seven to ten feet long. Uh, some. Oh my god! I want a seven foot long otter. Some stories say up to fifteen feet. It's often described... That's too big. Yeah, it's a little big. Seven foot. Seven foot's great. It's often described as having a white pelt with a wet or oily sheen, black ear tips, and a large black cross adorning its back. Its reputation for speed, ferocity, and appetite for human flesh has earned it the nickname the Irish Crocodile. Hmm. <laughs> Don't want one. <laughs> the Duarcu reside in deep lakes and rivers and occasionally even the seas and are known to travel great distances by water and land. It's believed to live throughout Ireland, though most sightings seem to come from the northwestern counties. Some theories connect it to Nessie. I've seen people hypothesize that Nessie is a older, more mature version of a Duarcu. Some even theorize that the Duarcu followed Irish immigrants to North America, accounting for their assortment of lake monsters, which is a nice story, but considering that most of the Native Americans had stories about lake monsters long before European colonization happened, I I think they might take some exception to that idea. The Duarcu are communal creatures. They usually live in pairs or sometimes in groups. When a Duarcu dies in battle, it emits an eerie, high-pitched whistle which will summon its mate immediately to avenge its death. That's a, like, handy evolutionary. (laughs) It does, doesn't it? (laughs) 
Some reports even tell of Duraku summoning as many as a hundred regular otters to its aid, earning it the nickname the King of Otters. I'm so jealous of this thing. <laughs> this story just gets better, doesn't it? <laughs> The Duraku comes from an old Irish word for otter. The etymology comes from the rarely used duer, meaning water, and ku, meaning hound. So it's literally water dog. Hebridean folklore, which is ancient Scottish, uh, says that anyone wearing the fur of the king of otters in the battle ensures his victory and, quote, the smoke of him will fell a man 60 yards away. I don't know what the smoke of him means. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that it means it smells real bad. It and could you're be. you're just going to die from that far I away. I mean, but... it could be. I was, I was trying to, I did a Google search for the smoke of him, looking for some regular poetic usage of it. And the closest I got was a collection of Hebrew poems that basically were talking about cremation, <laughs> which I don't so think that's just... what we're working with here. Are we just blowing ash into his third yeah. eyes? Well, and also I got a result for the Urban Dictionary for smoking a person. <laughs> Which I guess from 60 yards, I can, you know. Recorded reports of the Duraku go back as far as 1684, though the oral tellings go back much further. In 1896, an encounter is recorded in the Journal of Royal Society of Antiques by a Miss Walkington who spied a creature that was half wolf dog and half fish. A letter sent to her from a Mr. H. Chichester Hart, this is where I told you these pronunciations are going to kill me, identified the beast as the Duraku, which Hart called the King of Lakes and Father of All Otters. Sraheen's Lock on Achill Island, County Mayo, has the largest amount of modern sightings. A small pop- Can't get an episode without a mention of Mayo, can we? <laughs> It's our it's our hidden pineapple. <laughs> On Psych, they put a pineapple every episode. We put mayo in every episode. <laughs> Sometimes it's just in our hair. <laughs> a small population has been reported to live there, though reportedly they tend to be migratory. So if you don't find them, that's the reason why. The most recent sighting was in 2003 on Omi Island in Connemara County, Galway, and it was described as being long and dark with orange flippers. It swam the width of the lake in what seemed like a few seconds, leapt onto a boulder, and emitted a most haunting screech before disappearing. The most well, she had orange teeth like a nutria. <laughs> no, we don't want to be like a nutria. We want to be like an otter. Just in the tooths. Okay. The most intriguing record of the Duraku encounter comes from Glendale County Latrim. On September 22nd, 1722, so the 200 year anniversary of that, no, 300 year anniversary of that's coming up. So everybody mark your calendar for next year. September 22nd, 1722, a woman, no, it's 400, I can't, no, two, I was right, 300. I can't math. On September 22nd, 1722. I'm a girl, I can't help you. <laughs> Know about all that boy stuff. <laughs> Don't ask me. I'm just a girl. <laughs> On September twenty second, seventeen twenty two, a woman went down to the lake to bathe and do some laundry and not math. By the <laughs> for the best. <laughs> by the name of Grain McLoylan, or more commonly called Grace Connolly. <laughs> Both- <laughs> So, <laughs> these are the reports I read, okay? I didn't make that up. I don't know why they turned grain into grace. I guess maybe it's easier on anglicized tongues. But Connolly was her maiden name, and at the time women would often keep their maiden name. So that's... Her husband was McGloylin, but she was Connolly. Now I'm just thinking of that Say Anything song about Molly Connolly, but that's different. Go ahead. While she was at the water's edge, the Duraku burst forth from the water and attacked her, tearing the poor woman apart. Her husband, Terence McGloylin, <laughs> or, or, or Ross Davidson, as he was also known. No. <laughs> Bob Smith. <laughs> Terence arrived at the lake to check on his wife, only to find her slain and the great monster napping amongst her scattered remains. He quickly unsheathed his dagger and slayed the sleeping beast. But that only elicited it to release the high-pitched whistle while in its death throes. <laughs> Another Duraku tore out of the water to avenge the fallen mate, and Terence only just managed to mount his horse and start riding away. The creature kept pace with him for miles, and by the time it slowed its pursuit, Terence found himself in the stone fort of Cachelgarin. Terence entered the fort and found a blacksmith, figuring he would need his horse reshod after such a chase. He gave the blacksmith 
uh, the tale of his harrowing adventure, but the blacksmith was a wise man in such affairs, coincidentally. He gave Terence a sword and told him, when the creature charges, he'll put his head right through your horse. As soon as he does this, you be quick and cut his head off. Terence took his sword and remounted the horse. The horse knew nothing. And <laughs> left the fort to go meet the beast again. He found the Duraku eagerly awaiting his return and charged at him. Just as the blacksmith said, the creature plunged his head through the horse and Terence leaned over and put his sword through the monster, killing it instantly. So, the most intriguing part of this story is that Grace's headstone still stands and is mostly identifiable. Grace's gravestone is a fat piece, a flat piece of flagstone. Four she and a got half. a fat piece of flagstone. Fat piece of flagstone. Uh, See, Liz that's in every episode. Boom. Or every story. No, sorry. <laughs> Uh, the, the flagstone is four and a half feet on one side, a foot ten inches on the other. The stone's very worn and flaking off in places. Uh, most of the text is rubbed off, but it's still visible, though, is the relief of the doer coup lying with its head turned to the sky, conveying its death. There's a spear-like weapon that pierces the beast at the base of its neck and protrudes again from beneath its body, and a human hand holding the weapon. A small relief of Terence astride his horse resides on t the top edge of the stone, and supposedly the Duraku itself and Terence's horse are both buried near Cashelgaron, where they fell, although I didn't find any photos of that grave. So, there is a giant otter in the fossil records. And you thought I butchered the Gaelic names, get ready for the Latin. Ceramagade Melilutru? It was an otter the size of a wolf and uh, weighed about 50 kilograms and had an extremely strong bite, basically designed for crunching through the shells of mollusks. It... An otter the size of a wolf? <laughs> yep. Uh, they lived in the late Miocene era, which was about six million years ago, but so far the only evidence they found of it is in the Yunnan region of China. So that's uh, quite a ways off from Ireland. So that's my Irish horse otter, wolf otter. Giant otter. Irish horse offer. Offer? Offer. Irish horse offer. <laughs> so you have a brand new, not Irish car bomb St. Patrick's drink, eh? Right. I mean, that was a big challenge for sure. And, well, um, I was, I, I, I kind of feared it. I thought it might be a rough one. Also, like even just brainstorming this made me want Irish coffee so bad, which I have <laughs> not yet had. I'm going to try to hold off. For a couple of days, because, yeah, dying, whatever. <laughs> and I'm putting whipped cream in this drink. In the Irish coffee, I will be making for my own consumption, not in the drink or the episode. Yeah. But. But if you want to put whipped cream in it, we don't judge. Whatever you do outside our auspices, not our problem. It's, it's true. It's totally your opinion. But I that doesn't mean I'm not going to judge you for it. <laughs> you like. Anyway, in my... Travels, I discovered that Absolute Vodka released two vodkas with Lizzo. <laughs> Their juice line. Yeah. So, you know, it makes sense. <laughs> one is a strawberry and one is an apple. Apple sounds a little more Irish than a strawberry does. But... I think strawberries grow in Ireland. I don't know. They should. Not like they do in Linden. But... <laughs> I don't know if they're indigenous there, but they, I mean, they should grow there. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's a British thing. Now I'm sad I didn't fact check that ahead of time. We're moving Why'd on. Why you We're... do that to me? Sorry, that's what I hear. I ruin everything. I ruin the good times. I come in with come in with a giant otter and I leave out with your self-confidence. So, <laughs> haven't fine-tuned the recipe on this at all yet because I have a child with five teeth. So, this will be, <laughs> this will be fine-tuned before the episode comes out. But, basis of this recipe is going to be... We're going to use a little bit of that apple absolute juice in honor of Our Lady Lizzo. <laughs> and then we're going to use a little bit of Irish whiskey. We're going to muddle some fresh blackberries in there, but you can use frozen if you don't have fresh available. I really wanted to use currants, but that's not really realistic this time of year where I live, unless I wanted to get like dried ones, and that's just the whole other thing. <laughs> and I think I'm going to throw some basil and a little lemon in there. Yeah. Maybe some soda water if necessary. All right. Fruity, flavorful. Yeah. I like the sound of it. Kind of, kind of springy. Yeah. I mean, a little more summery, but yeah. but you know, not just your everyday haberdashery Irish car bomb kind of Guinness. We got a St. Patrick's drink for people who are looking for something a little more flavorful, a little more gentle to the palate. And it's not gonna like, be an overwhelming whiskey drink. It'll be 
a nice light, light thing. Well, that's what that's what's missing from St. Patrick's Day because most traditional St. Patrick's drinks are like a fucking grinder to the face. Like they're just we're gonna get totally wasted. Like it's an aggressive drink, but this one's much more gentle. Like I was discussing with Sean last night. I was like, part of me almost wanted to put Avid cider out of Ben makes this apple blackberry current cider and I'm like part of me wants to put that in there because it kind of has the flavor profiles I'm looking for but I just feel like whiskey vodka and a cider <laughs> is probably a little too aggressive for our day-to-day drinkers so is this a day-to-day drink or is it a St. Patrick's drink well it's a St. Patrick's mm-hmm. drink but like I said amateur night and we don't oh, okay. want I don't want I don't need anyone puking, cursing making our name. bad decisions. <laughs> cursing your name as they hurl into the porcelain god. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. so we need a name. We we did briefly discuss names. I don't know if you have anything. I mean, I, I kind of liked Lizzo the Irish. Was that? Yeah, I like Lizzo the Irish. That's. But I'm open to other, other options. I really don't know how to improve on that unless you can somehow fit a giant otter into there. And I don't know how to do that. Liz Otter. James and the Giant Peach, Lizzo and the Giant Otter. <laughs> That's a children's book someone needs to write. Yeah. That might not be our, uh, or maybe that is our, <laughs> maybe that's what we need to do. <laughs> All right, so our new drink, recipe pending, Lizzo the Irish. All right, Lizzo the Irish. That's the easiest non-argumentative drink name we've come up with yet, I think. <laughs> Next episode is going to be a first for us. We're actually going to have a guest. She made it through the whole episode. We didn't scare her off. I know. God bless the poor woman. <laughs> Someone should send her, like, a gift basket or a Xanax. <laughs> we should have sent her a Xanax before we recorded. We should have. She was smart. She brought a beverage to drink. She knew what she was in for, so. Because <laughs> I'm a pusher. <laughs> Not a pusher. I'm an enabler. One of our friends, the first time he went to the bars with me, asked me if I had been a courtesan in a past life because people around me just felt like they could indulge in whatever way they wanted to. And I was like, (laughs) Anyway, um, Amanda from Spook Eats is going to be our guest on the next episode. Yeah, she's going to talk about her upcoming uh, journal she is compiling about women and paranormal, which I, for one, am excited about. The feminine macabre, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And she'll also talk a little bit just about her website and how she got started in the paranormal business, hobby, world. World is probably the appropriate response there. <laughs> she has some good stories, so, you know, it should be some good stuff. And I'm pretty excited for the drink we'll have for that episode as well. And it was Kate and mine's easiest episode because Amanda was the ideal guest because she was always ready to talk and always had a story. And Kate and I just had to sit there and listen. We had to do zero prep. It was a total vacation for us. <laughs> Nick says that like I put a lot of effort into prepping ever. <laughs> As displayed by my stellar performance with each each recording. <laughs> so be sure to check out our show notes. They'll be on our website at boozeandspirits.com. Be sure to check out our podcast on all the regular podcast culprits. Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify. Be sure to check out our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Podcast. We've got lots of clips that we cut out of the show. We've got some raw recordings of our episodes in case you want to take those and recut the show better than we do. Because You can get feet pics if you really want. If you really want feet pics, you can do that. No one's, no one's uh, gone for that yet, they but it is not. an option. <laughs> and you can pick between Nick or I. So, so hey. There it Send is. us a message. I could probably even get you some dog feed. There it is. It'll be rolling. Follow us. Way. Yeah. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. All the goodies. We don't do the other social media. This is enough for us. <sighs> Maybe someday. It's too much for us. <laughs> We're getting old, guys. We're getting old. We have a YouTube channel. The next episode actually does have a nice video to go along with it. The episode you get on podcast will be edited down for who knows whatever reason that we'll probably have to edit things down. But the full interview will be on YouTube this time so you can see all of us in our various and sundry domiciles as we talk about ghosts and drinks. Very exciting. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm positively buzzing just thinking about it. Um, yeah. 
I think that's it for us. That's that, that it for us. I guess we can shuffle off the buffalo. Oh yeah, I should probably get this uh, this giveaway I taunted you with up and running. That I'll get that up and running soon. <laughs> I haven't decided a day. Yeah, I've been trying to come up with a new uh, sticker giveaway plan, too, but I haven't come up with it yet. I've been working on it. Well, we have a new sticker idea today. We have we several. Do. We do. I mean, the trifecta of panting. <laughs> An epic poem. <laughs> Part of the Lizzo and the Giant Otter saga. <laughs> you know, the internet's just going to like come down on us <laughs> and get rid of us. Not like people. Like, literally, the internet is just going to cut us off. <laughs> You've had enough internet. You've used your allowance. <laughs> this is not what we're here for. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> with that, <laughs> please drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost. <laughs> and we will see you next time. <laughs> Catch you on the flip side. <laughs> I was just going to say bye, but you do robot noises. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> okay. I want to